before I dive into my message, and I want to start with a story, <clears throat> some of you know my background is um, an engineering and mechanical background, and I discovered something about repair and mill rights and um, different individuals who, who, who fix things, uh, specifically in industrial settings. Uh, I've worked in and been in different environments, and this is what I noticed. There's two types of people who, um, who repair things. There's the first type is the individual who has worked for the same con- uh, company for decades. And so by default, they have all of the equipment memorized, and they're the expert in the organization. But if you were to take that individual out of their familiarity, the, out of that space, and place them into a different environment, a different mechanical setting, they wouldn't be able to fix a sandwich, Okay. Now, there's the other type of person who approaches everything mechanical with the idea of it's all nuts and bolts. And you take the same philosophies, you take the same ideas and, 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 and trigger, uh, questioning, starting with the most simple things, because most times it's simple, not too fast, not too big. And, and, and that is the type of individual that I've found that's really quality in their ability to, to make repairs quickly and most cost effective. Well, that translated, that carried into my ministerial life. Me, meaning this, if I could just, if, if everyone can see this table, no matter where you're sitting, sometimes I think we treat theology or the things that we talk about with the things of God as the one item. We, we tend to all hover on one particular area. And, and it's not that it's bad, it's that at best, all we do is we talk about different perspectives. And so depending on where I'm looking, I'm kind of looking at the same thing, but I might be looking at the same thing, just a little bit different. I took a, a systematic theology course a decade ago, and the, uh, the instructor used this analogy. Uh, our life is like the stage. He called it the stage of life. And, and with the stage of life, on this stage is a table, but what about the drums? What about the keys? What about... Um, uh, the microphones and the guitars, there are other things in the background within the scriptures that, that are really important. And, and what they'll do is they'll give some depth and understanding. And so it is my aim each week not to teach something that's so radically different, but hopefully to bring some other things into the scriptures or into our topics, our talks, so that we can begin to see a little bit broader, so that we can be uh, a little bit more revelated on the things of these ancient texts, because we didn't grow up in that culture, and if we're not careful, we'll read through these things through our lenses as first world Americans. And, and, and we need to know the, uh, one person said it this way, what's not being said? There's a lot of things in the scriptures that are not being said because the writer of that letter knew that the recipient knew that. It was an obvious if we could fast forward 50 or 100 years from now and someone wrote a story about you being here on a Monday night, I don't think that I would include that you all drove here. But I'm guessing as I look around, nobody walked here. Maybe you had a motorcycle, but something mechanical brought you here. I may not add that into the story because it would be assumed. There's a lot of things in the scriptures that are are not said, that if we understand them today, opens up the scriptures. They become alive and exciting again. So today, I almost was going to call this message a part number two from last week, but it's different enough. It's a continuation. I'm calling it, Who Am I? Because I want to talk to you tonight about identity and the the power of identity and what that should mean to us as Christians. And and if you'll allow me, maybe maybe we're starting tonight ankle deep, but if if you allow me, maybe we go knee deep or waist deep. We can go into a little bit deeper waters and ask God to do something in our minds and hearts today. I think that we can leave change, especially how we see ourselves and how we see other people. Amen? Are you with me? Okay. Let me share this story. Hit the wrong button. So a man took a seat on an airplane next to a beautiful woman. After some small talk, he asked her, "Uh, what do you look for in a man? She instantly replied, well, I, I like someone who can think on their feet and swift like an American Indian. She thought for a second and then said, well, you know, I also appreciate men who have made a lot of money. Uh, Many of my, many Jewish men I've met are great businessmen. And then after a moment of further consideration, she said, but I also like cowboys, you know, who drive pickup trucks and have a gun rack in the back. She paused, turned to the man and asked, by the way, what is your name? The man looked her in the eye and answered, 
My name is Geronimo Goldstein, but my friends call me Bubba. Okay. I, so, I, so I go home every week and I ask my, they're, they're accustomed to it. I ask my children, what was your takeaway? And they thought this, this joke, this story was about Bubba Gump from, from I'm like, Forrest Gump, yeah. Uh, no, it's just a, a man trying to be someone that he's not to impress somebody that he doesn't even know. And, and I think that's what happens when we don't know who we are. We try to be something to someone or everyone, and we lose sight of who we really are. And what happens to you, you probably, you, you've at least tasted it of this, when you try to become something to everybody else, it, it erodes the very foundation uh, of our peace. It, it unravels the fabric of our joy and, and our purpose in life is that question because we're not really sure who we are. And so today as we talk about identity, I, I think in our culture, the, the internet world, uh, cyber crimes on the rise of identity theft, well, it's not a new thing. In fact, identity crisis actually started all the way back in the garden. In Genesis chapter 1, we see that God is creating the earth. He's creating the, the cosmos. He's putting it all together in days. And each time he completes one step, he stops, he looks at it, and he calls it good. Isn't it interesting that God calls it good even though it's not done? I, I said this the last two services. I want to say it again to hear tonight. I think some of us need to hear that. Maybe you're not where you want to be. Maybe you've not, a, not arrived to the goal but God is wanting you to know that you're good along the way. Amen? Amen? Yes. And, and that should encourage us because if you lose sight of that, you're tempted to try to become something different or someone different. If you're familiar with the text, you know it carries on where God now creates this perfect garden. He places man, Adam, in the garden, then creates Eve from Adam. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see a hard turn in the wrong direction. Let's look at verse number 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals. Uh, one of the translations says that he is the most cunning of all of the animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Well, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat or even touch it. If you do you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. When she gave some to her husband who was with her, he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breeze were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you were walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked told you you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, like an elementary school aged immature little boy, it was that woman that you gave me who gave it to me and I ate it. And then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the serpent, she said, the serpent deceived me. Say deceived. deceived. The serpent deceived me and that is why I ate. There's a lot going on in this, this, these verses here. How many know if you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived? Right. Otherwise, you wouldn't be right. deceived. This says that the serpent was the most cunning or the most shrewd of all the created animals. The, the interesting part of the root word of that, that shrewd or cunning is the exact same root word for the word naked. In other words, the moment that she disobeyed and was deceived, she believed the lie of the serpent. She no longer identified with God because he lied. She already was like God. But now she believed that her identity had shifted and she was aligning herself with the serpent, no longer with God. The rest of the story would go on that God is so caring, God is so concerned that he begins to prophesy, declare how he was going to fix the situation. 
he says it's going to be through her seed that the Savior will come. How many know women don't have seed? They have egg. He was prophesying of the, the virgin birth, the seed that would come through the woman. God was interested in fixing the issue right from the get-go. It declares again that God is good. He's concerned. He's caring. Uh, he, was, he was really wanting to make it better. But the, the reality was she was deceived and she wasn't seeing right. And so what we see is this, this years go by, decades go by, centuries go by, and Jesus now comes on to the scene. And uh, one of his traveling uh, through a, uh, a town, he, he's created a crowd. People are drawn to him. And one of the tax collectors, not just any old tax collector, this was the tax collector of tax collectors. This was one of the original mob bosses. His name was Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was just as interested in seeing him as everyone else. And Zacchaeus, according to scripture, was a little man. He climbed up a tree to try to see what God looked like, Jesus looked like. And, uh, and so he's not well liked. He's quite hated. He, he's robbed most people in the village and those in the surrounding areas. And of all of the places that Jesus asked to go have dinner, he invites himself to go have dinner with Zacchaeus. And the people are offended. Of all of the places that Jesus, this rabbi, could go, he's going to his house. And we're not privy to the conversations. We don't know exactly what Jesus said, but what we do know is that when Jesus left, Zacchaeus was different. He was ready to, to resolve all of the issues, all the money he stole he wanted to pay back. I'm telling you, if we, if we act like a bridge and not a dam, we can actually connect people who are far from God and change their heart. You can't come close to Jesus and not change. Amen? But this is something interesting that Jesus says now after coming out of Zacchaeus' house. Look with me at Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Just, just look for a moment with me. It does not say that Jesus said he came to seek and save who was lost, but that which was lost. These, these words, these scriptures should provoke questions. Wait a minute. What is that that was lost? This impersonal preposition is not talking about a person. It's talking about something that was lost. So what was lost in the garden? Number one, identity. There are several things that Jesus has purchased back for us, but number one, beginning with who we are. Identity, because who we really are matters. Right believing leads to right living. We saw it evidenced in Zacchaeus. You, I've, in fact, I've seen it evident in my life, in your life, that when we believe right, we begin to live right because we live according to how we see ourselves. So identity matters. Secondly, that which was lost was our intimacy. Intimacy could be thought of this way. Into me, see. Intimacy was lost, not because God extracted himself, not that, because God was not wanting to be near. Intimacy was lost because we turned away. We, we decided not to follow according to the, the heritage of humanity. And it's when we turn towards God that intimacy is, is returned. And thirdly, influence. Influence was lost because according to James chapter one, a double-minded man is unstable in all of their ways. And so when we don't know who you are, you're unstable, you're questioning, you're, you're unsettled to who you really are by nature. Identity, I'd like to submit to you, is attached to our origin. Our identity is attached to our origin. We, we tend to believe, I think, and we did a good job talking about the fact that Jesus got in trouble with, with the religious leaders. Last week, we talked about God and Jesus being one. And they got really upset when he said, my father, because of the implication. But then he, then he really got the, the religious leaders upset when he began to say, our father, because the implication was not only is Jesus and the father one, but in Jesus, so are we one. And, th and when we see verses that say that, we're, we feel pretty safe in going, well, yeah, okay, Jesus and the father are one. Look at, look at John 3.16, if you put that up for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus was begotten of the father, so of course, his identity, his likeness, his image is like the Father. And we feel pretty safe in saying that. But let me just give you another illustration. I've got three sons. I used Gideon as my example uh, yesterday. Gideon is a McKinney, not because he chose to be a McKinney. 
He's a McKinney because I'm a McKinney. His daddy's a McKinney. And he is begotten of his father. And by the way, I didn't choose McKinney. McKinney was given to me because my father was a McKinney and I'm begotten of him. And because I'm begotten of him, I take on the characteristics and the likeness of my father and my son Gideon and Isaac and Isaiah and Grace for that matter. They are begotten of me. And in full transparency, Becky did play a pretty significant role in, in this, this, this family tree of ours, but they are of us. If, if we understood, if we understand that to be in Christ, that we are clothed in him, then, then we also are saying, if we believe that, that we are also begotten of the Father. Meaning that our likeness, our actions, our motives, our emotions, our desires, our efforts, our energies look like or should look like the Father. Genesis chapter one, verse number 26, the opening part of the verse anyway, says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The word man here is not specific to Adam. The word there is mankind. So if you're mankind, womankind, then you are made in the likeness, in, in, the, in, in the image of your creator. Now, some of us would go, okay, all right, I'm tracking with you, Pastor Bill. We're, we were ankle deep, now we're knee deep. Yep, okay, because of Christ. And, and like Pastor Steve said, because Jesus is the firstborn and we're in Christ, then we now get to live in the inheritance of the firstborns because of our faith. But what, what if I submitted to you that even those outside the faith, those that have yet to encounter Jesus are also made in God's image and in his likeness, and he's their father too. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I know some people who don't walk with Jesus. They don't talk like Jesus. They certainly don't act like Jesus. They're mean to me. They're mean to people. They're not nice people. That can't be true. Well, something that Pastor Steve alluded to as he was leading us in worship, Jesus came and saved the, all of creation. Let me go back to my, my son's analogy. Going again, using Gideon. If Gideon is not acting like uh, or behaving like I would like a good representation of his dad, does he cease being begotten of his dad? Mm -mm. Let's go one step further. Let's say that at birth he was separated from his mother and I, and he was raised by someone else, never even knowing that I was his father. Does that change the reality that he's still begotten of me? He may not be living like, he may not be associating with, but that doesn't change the fact that he is also begotten of the Father. In Jesus, we've all been reconciled. Look at this, how Paul says it. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse number 18. He says, and all things, say all things. all things. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and says, and has given to us, that would be you and me, the ministry of reconciliation. The, the word here, all things, is one word in the Greek language and it is aggressively inclusive. It literally means everyone, all things are reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, those that know it, you now have the ministry of reconciliation, meaning that the word reconcile is an accounting term. We've been brought into balance with the Father and Jesus has reconciled every one of the, uh, those who have yet to find out to him. It is now our privilege, not our obligation. It's our privilege to go let them know. That's why it's interesting when people would pray for their neighbor or their, their coworker, God, if you would just save them, how, if you would just save my neighbor, the only way that God could ever answer a prayer like that would be, I did. Go tell them, right? He's given you and I the ministry of reconciliation. We got to stop punting the responsibility and, and start receiving this as a gift from God that we are one with him. And now we get to go tell everyone who doesn't know it yet. Second Corinthians chapter three, just a couple chapters back. Paul breaks this down a little bit further and kind of explains it. He says, therefore, since we have such hope, we're very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what's passing away. 
but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because, watch this, only in Christ is it taken away. The veil that blinds them, the deception that blinds them is only removed in Christ. It goes on to verse number 15. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. The word turns here, it, it, another translation calls it return, but it means to return to where we've wandered from. You see, when you turn to the Lord, you're not going back to someplace new. You're actually returning to your original design. And when you return to the Lord, you return to where you wandered, the veil is removed, and now you get to see who you really are in Christ. I think it's important for us to understand what that means for those around us that don't know Jesus yet that don't have the experience that you have. If someone is blinded, if they're deceived, they really believe what they actually see. Insulting them, being critical and judging them for living by by all they ever know isn't gonna help the situation. It's not not what saved you. It's not what rescued you. It's not what won your heart over. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm confident in saying that. That is not what won me over. It was God's goodness that captured my heart. Amen? Can anyone testify that it was God's goodness? Amen. Luke chapter 15, as as it was Jesus' custom, everywhere he went, it seemed like the broken, the lost, the naughty ones were the ones that were really interested in hearing about him. And there's another scenario here that we're about to see where Jesus is sitting down to talk and the sinners are showing up. Verse number one, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near Jesus to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so he told them this parable, saying, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the other 99 in the open pasture to go after the one that's lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, He puts it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my sheep that was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents or changes the way he thinks than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Jesus is talking to this crowd in, in, a, in a heart and a motive of honor and value because Jesus saw them as sons and daughters of God. I said this before, and I'm gonna, it, it sounds so like, I'll just say it. I'm one of the most gracious people I know, okay? That seems like an ungracious thing to say, but it's, I, I really, like, I say that with true humility because I, I understand the forgiveness that I've been given. I, and not that I've arrived at it, like I'm still amazed by it. Okay, so grace is a big deal to me. I, I want to give grace. I want to give mercy to people. Now that being said, I'm still a dad. And there's some carnality still working out. It's my salvation in this thing. And so even if one of my children were out doing something that was wrong and not acting in a way that, good, that represents their dad or represents the church or does things that are, are, aren't that great, if you go after one of my kids, if you start assaulting them, attacking them, calling them names, ridicule them, assault them on social media, I'm telling you, there might be some carnality that rises up out of this dad that may have to be dealt with later after we settle some things, Okay. And I'm not even a guy who likes to brawl, but I'm talking about my kids, okay? I'm I'm back up. I'm an earthly dad. And I I, I wanna protect my children. I love my children. I think we should be very careful, ever feeling justified about criticizing, uh, being cruel, calling names, being judgmental to somebody who's yet to come to the faith because that's one of God's kids. And I love God. And I think that you love God. And I don't wanna mock and make fun of one of God's kids. Amen. So Jesus is talking to them 
with value. Maybe you've seen this quote before. The devil knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. The father knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. And I I believe that's why they were so attracted to Jesus because Jesus wasn't identifying with their brokenness. He wasn't calling them out by their addictions and their faults. He was talking to them by who they really were. And that felt good. And the Pharisees, all they could see is the exterior brokenness. And within the culture of religion, not relationship, religion says you need to do this first before you can experience. And Jesus says you need to experience so you have the power to do. Good preaching. Let's keep going. In Luke chapter 15, so the next parable, the story that Jesus gives is about a woman who's lost some coins. She tears the whole house up trying to find them. And when she does, she celebrates. And then finally, we get to the parable that most of us would call the prodigal son, but that's not what Jesus called it. When he goes into this third parable of this chapter, he starts off in verse number 11 with, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate that is coming to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the young son gathered everything together and went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate in wild living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began doing without. So he went and hired himself out uh, to one of the citizens uh, of that country And he sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to have his fill of the carob pods that the pigs were eating. And no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, one translation says that when he he came to himself, the, the Greek word there means to return to self, or when he returned to who he really was, he said to himself, how many of my father's hired laborers have more than enough to more, uh, more than enough bread, but I'm here dying here of hunger. I'm going to set out and go to my father, and this is what I'm going to say to him. He prepares this amazing speech, and here here's the speech that he prepares to tell his father. He says, "Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So treat me as one of your hired laborers." And so he set out to, and uh, sent out and came to his father. But when he was still a long way off. Someone say, a long way off. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran and embraced him and kissed him. Pause. The story is about the heavenly father. The son who went off and did all of the things. This is not the posture of the father. It says that he saw his son from a long way off. Meaning that the father didn't just go about his business. He was waiting, looking, watching for his son. And when he was a long ways off, he didn't wait for the son to hit the ground and grovel and come complain and beg for mercy. It says the the father couldn't help himself. He ran for the son. Now you got to understand in that era, the patriarchs would never run. Because in order to run, you'd have to lift your garment and expose your legs. It was never something that an elder of the family would do. In addition to this, when that son cut himself off from the family, it was culturally a custom that you were were cut off to never return. You were dead to that family. And the whole village and town would have done the same thing. And the father could care less. I don't care if it makes me look stupid. I'm pulling my garment up. I'm running past all my neighbors and I don't care what they see when I get to my son. He grabs the son, he kisses his neck and he begins to love on his son. But the son is like, wait, 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 dad. I've got this sweet speech. Hang on, I got it all written down. Let me get it out and unfold it. And the son said to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves or his servants, quickly, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Did you notice that the father didn't even acknowledge one word that the son had said? He didn't answer it. He didn't say, thank you, I receive it. He just went about his business. He called on his servants and he said, go get the robe, get the ring and get the sandals. This is so powerful and so significant because the robe signified full acceptance. 
It was probably a certain color of their family so that everyone who saw it saw that he was fully accepted, fully loved, completely brought into the family. And when he put the ring on the son's finger, it wasn't for bling. It wasn't because of of royalty. The ring symbolized authority. And instantly he put the ring on his son and said, son, you have my authority as one representative of me. And then he said, get the sandals. Because only servants walked around barefoot. The sons and daughters wore sandals. It's awesome. We're talking about the father here. And bring the fatted calf, slaughter it, and let's eat and celebrate. This is symbolic of a reminder of the covenant that was made. We're celebrating again the covenant that this is an image, a shadow of Jesus. He goes on to say, he was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son, the older brother in the story, was in the field. And when he came in and approached the house, He heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began to inquire what these things could be. He said to them, your brother has come, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry, was not willing to go in, and the father came out and began pleading with him. But But he answered and said to his father, look, For so many years, I have been serving you. As we read the other translation, I've been slaving for you. And I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet, you never gave me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. He said to him, son, you've always been with me and all that is mine is yours But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and been found. I've seen this played out in church before. Maybe you have too. Maybe you've been subject to this before. There's there's people in our midst, those that have watched this online, that they know what it's like to pull a prodigal move. And... And, and maybe you haven't, maybe you've been one that has remained, but when someone has gone out and misrepresented who they are as a Christian, they misrepresented the church, they, they, they did bad things, they, did, they said harmful things, and when they came back, isn't there something kind of inside of us sometimes that wants them to pay a little bit for what they did? It's the older brother in us that wants to come out, and we want justice, and we want restitution. And that is not the heart of God here. Last Thursday, we had a gentleman, a guest speaker by the name of Steve Thomas. He was a great communicator and did a bang-up job. And he said a few things that really helped me. And, and he, he created this funnel of, of influence. And on the, the very basis of it, he, he calls it his default people mode. Your default people mode is how you see people. Now, and I want to share this analogy, this example. If, if Ken Moore lies to me, we call him a, a liar. But is that true? Isn't he a person that lied? But the moment my default people mode goes to he's a liar, now I see him differently. And if we're not careful, we'll treat people who have yet to encounter Jesus with a default mode, not for who they are, but what they're doing, and if, we're, and if we still don't get that healed in us, we'll treat people who have drifted in this default people mode and we'll see them by their actions, not how God sees them, who they truly are. We, we need to practice repentance. And just so we're all on the same page here, repentance is not the same thing as saying, I'm sorry. It's a Greek word that means change your way of thinking, change your mind, change your direction. Look at with me at Acts chapter 2. I want to tie a couple of verses here together. Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. We tend to use this verse for water baptism, and it fits. Then Peter said to them, repent, change the way that you think about God, and let every one of you be baptized or immersed completely in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say be baptized in water. It does say be baptized, be immersed 
in the name of Jesus. So in other words, if you and I would practice repentance, change the way you've been thinking, maybe change the way you're thinking about uh, some difficult people in your life. Maybe change the way you think about yourself when you're acting difficult. Be fully immersed in Christ. And in doing so, we receive the power of the Holy Spirit to live from this identity that's actually truly who we are. Now, let me tie a verse to this. Go to Acts chapter three, verse number 19. Again, it starts with repent. Change the way that you think. Repent, therefore, and be converted. The word converted means to return to where you wandered. I've been a Christian for the majority of my life. And I'm telling you, I'll testify, I'll admit to you that I've wandered from where I'm supposed to be before. And you don't have to admit to it, but I know it's true. You've done that too. Maybe to different scales, but change the way that you think. Return to where you've wandered from, that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. How many could use some refreshing in their life? And it's not just a one dab will do you kind of thing. I need refreshing in my life because I have all kinds of things that try to take away my peace, try to rob my joy. And so I need to constantly practice. You need to constantly practice repentance, changing the way that you think, asking God to help us, make sure that we're feeding ourselves with things that are consistent with what God says about you, about others. As I already said, uh, I wish we Christians, once we made a commitment to Jesus, we didn't have to stumble and fall and make mistakes to learn the way, but the reality is we all have, right? And as a person who is a person of faith and a person who's following Jesus, if you've misstepped and if, if you've made some, some oops or done a piece of stupid, I think we should give grace to people who have yet to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Would you agree? Let me share a quote. I've shared this before. It's a statement by Will Rogers. He says there are three kinds of men, ones that learn by reading, a few who learn by observation, and the rest of us, we have to pee on the electric fence to find out for ourselves. (laughs) Figuratively speaking. First service on Sunday, someone shouted, or actually, meaning, meaning, and thank you for allowing me the humor of that statement, meaning that we sometimes misstep and we walk with Jesus. We need to be people of grace, people of mercy for people who have yet to encounter the Lord. Psalms 34, my final verse, verse eight, says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So if you've experienced things that have caused harm, if you've experienced things that have depleted you, then you're in the right place because we can experience the God who brings refreshing and we can experience and taste and see that God is good. His opinion for you hasn't changed. His opinion for those that have yet to encounter him hasn't changed. He sent Jesus to reconcile all of us And we get the privilege of living in that today. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray over you. I got asked point blank on Thursday by somebody I just met. They said, can you tell me why Jesus came? And my my knee-jerk response is to reveal the Father. Okay. And he kept prodding, prodding, prodding. I'm like, I'm I'm sorry, what are you you getting at? Like, what do you want me to say? (laughs) And he said, well, I, I expected that you'd say Jesus came so that we could go to heaven. And I said, well, I understand that that's, that's a pretty prominent message among Christians. But I think the message of Jesus was that when we repent, when, when we begin to experience God, we draw heaven to earth. And so Jesus came to reveal the Father that we could experience the kingdom now. And the fact that some of us are living in that, we should never take it for granted And we should continue to thank God that we're rescued and we're saved and we're walking this out and that his mercy and grace is new every morning and that we need to share that. What we've received, we need to freely give. Amen. Amen. So Father, across this room, we thank you for Jesus. And I pray for the two primary groups this, this evening and those that might watch this online. For those that are walking with you already, Lord, thank you for helping us uh, to change the way that we think. Thank you for allowing us to go into a new perspective of even how you see people who are far from you. God, in that, we receive the, the, the refreshing that comes by your presence. We're reminded of your faithfulness towards us even when we're not. And Lord, those that are here today that courageously visited a church, that I, I know it took a lot for some of us to be here, it's my prayer that the 
the image that they see that's imprinted on their hearts would be the father in the story in Luke 15 of the one who sprints to those, the one that that makes the first move, that hugs and kisses and rescues and saves and celebrates. God, there's no reason for any of us tonight to leave without the assurance of who we are in Jesus. Lift the veil. Reveal Jesus to us personally, intimately. God, we confess that Jesus is not only Savior, but our Lord. And that he's leading us now in newness of life as we experience that forgiveness. Help us to grow in that. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.